So if you're after organizational cybernetics framework for diagnosing and designing organizations, you're in the right meetup. So first of all, welcome all, uh, especially welcome to our new members. Um, many thanks for joining and please feel free to reach out to us, the organizers, via the meetup. Um, if um, we can help in any way. By the way, just to double check, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So our community, interesting, reached, uh, we were hoping to reach above 400. It reached 415 today and it's truly spread across the world. So we have six continents, 21 countries, 48 cities. Um, we are still looking for someone from Antarct Antarctica, but uh, we'll get there slowly. So first of all, uh, a bit of intro about uh, systems at play. So why do we care about having these meetups? It was mainly um, the community was born out of two main inspirations. The first one was in response to the current dominant reductionist way of thinking and acting in the world. And the second one is the difficulty of understanding the deep and vast space of systems thinking and practical ways of applying it. So soon this turned into a passion and aspiration to learn together more effective ways um, of being, thinking and acting with the awareness of systems in our personal life, the way we organize work and our community. So for today we have a really, really distinguished um, uh, speaker. So Jose Perez's Rio's research is focused on application of systems dynamics and organizational cybernetics to the study of complex systems and to the development of software tools that can facilitate the application of different systemic approaches as well as knowledge capture, communication and information exchange. So he has been also responsible for creating um, the VS Mod software, which facilitates the application of organizational cybernetics and the viable system models. Jose has been director of area of international relations at the University of Valladolid from 2000 to 2006. He has also worked in multiple national and international research projects and has more than 80 publications in national and international journals and congresses and five books, including um, Diseño y Diagnóstico de Organizaciones Viabilis, I hope I said that right, and the Design and Diagnostic of Sustainable Organization also the viable systems model. Um, honorary, honorary distinctions are the uh, Cybernetics Research Award 2006, awarded by the World Organization of Systems and Cybernetics. Also the outstanding reviewer for the Journal of Cybernetic Kubernetes and the Honorary HSSS Award um, as Distinguished Scientist by the Hellenic Society of Systems Studies. He also has um, also is a member of the board of directors of the World Organization of Systems and Cybernetics and academician in the International Academy of Systems and Cybernetics Sciences. So a really, really extinct, uh, distinguished uh, career and achievements. A couple of more things about us, guys. Um, this session will be recorded and it will be posted on the Systems at Play YouTube channel. So you can find there our past uh, recordings. Um, uh, there are many of them. So yeah, do put a uh, like where you like the presentations and also uh, please feel free to add any comments. So presentation will be recorded and made public. So all comments will be um, basically heard by everyone. Please stay on mute during the presentation, um, but feel free to put uh, the questions in the chat during the presentation and there will be also a Q&A uh, time after the presentation to answer them. Before we begin, any other questions? Any questions? Okay, it, no, if not, uh, Jose, would you like to share the screen? Now okay, I'll go. go. I'll try.
Thank you. Do you see it? Yes, I can see it, but a bit to the it's a bit to the right. So perfect. That's good. Uh, okay. Excellent. Well, uh, let's see if we don't have surprises with the screen sharing <laughs> issue. <laughs> um, then, in, do, uh, do I start, Mikhail? Yes, please. Please start. Okay. This is a okay. perfect view. Uh, perfect. Well, um, uh, good morning or good night or good afternoon, I don't know, <laughs> to, uh, to uh, any of the uh, persons that are um, uh, watching us. Uh, the first thing I would like to say uh, before starting my presentation is to thank uh, Mikhail uh, Sestakov uh, for inviting me uh, to participate in these sessions uh, in, within this uh, group that for me is a, a fantastic surprise uh, and, and, uh, and uh, I consider it a quite excellent um, idea uh, to spread the systems thinking uh, as much as possible uh, throughout companies, organizations, etc. So, Mikhail, congratulations for this um, initiative. Uh, I find it fantastic. Um, well, my <laughs> Also shared with so Dave and Alidad, so thank you. Um, in, well, my presentation, um, after talking with Mikhail, uh, we agreed on, on, on making some uh, reasonable uh, description of what uh, the organizational cybernetic approach uh, may offer uh, to managers, leaders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, uh, my presentation is entitled an, an Organizational Cybernetic Framework for Diagnosing and Designing Organizations. Uh, well, uh, the first question that uh, comes to my mind um, when we uh, talk uh, in a manager's environment, etc., uh, is this uh, this question: Is there an approach or discipline in management theory that can facilitate a relatively quick diagnosis of any organization? Uh, because this is something that all managers are concerned to how to diagnose or design uh, a healthy organization. Well, uh, the answer. Obviously, uh, is in our cases, uh, we think yes. And uh, I, this is the purpose of my presentation is trying to um, convince uh, the audience that uh, this approach that we are going to um, in, co uh, comment uh, is good for that, to make a relatively quick um, diagnosis of any organization, no matter if it is big, small, public, private, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, no? So, the structure of my presentation is organized in the following way. First, I will make a, 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 some short reflections about uh, uh, systems thinking and complexity and about what approaches uh, exist within uh, in the field of systems thinking that may help to uh, cope with the complexity. Uh, and then the, the core of the presentation will be dedicated uh, to the, the um, approach of organizational cybernetics. Well, the first um, thing I, I would like to say when I start in, in, in speeches like this uh, is, is a quotation from Jay Forrester uh, that he did in the 1986. Uh, Forrester uh, was a creator, um, as probably most of you know, of the system dynamics uh, methodology that was developed in the MIT in the 50s. And then um, it, it generated a, a, a lot of practitioners throughout the, 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 the decades. Uh, now we can uh, say that this this society, the system dynamics society, has uh, many more than one thousand members, and there are hundreds or probably thousands of of practitioners of that discipline. Well, Forrester was saying at that time uh, the following: the new frontier of humanity at the end of the twentieth century is not so much scientific or technological development as an understanding of the complex social systems complex social systems. This is the focus uh, of my presentation. Mm, well, um, 
the, the situation uh, that we are facing in all kinds of organizations is obvious for, for, for all of us. No? Uh, the complexity and diversity of the world problems uh, are evident. No? Uh, degradation of the environment, climate change, immigration, um, demographic transition, et cetera, et cetera. So all of us are aware of the, the big variety uh, of world problems that affect companies, organizations, countries, et cetera. No? And uh, uh, with an additional component uh, uh, that is that they, all these problems are interrelated uh, and uh, they have something in, com in common, all of them that are quite complex. Uh, the, the question that comes to our mind is, uh, could anything have been done uh, in, to avoid that humanity reached this situation? Uh, or something that it may be more interesting is, can we do something? Can anything be done now uh, to try to improve the situation? Um, the answer is related to the difficulty of addressing these problems. Uh, if, if we have them, uh, it's because they are complex. Uh, this is why they have been so difficult to, uh, to handle. Uh, well, if, if, if the complexity is the issue, um, then we have a, a, a question that is, well, how we measure complexity, how we qual quantify complexity. And here uh, we uh, will use the, the concept of variety that was uh, developed uh, and proposed by Ross Ashby, one of the big cyberneticians of the um, uh, last century. Uh, after I will indicate what we mean with variety. Um, so th this is the indicator, and this is, uh, let's say, our enemy, what we will try to handle no? uh, in the sense of, of problematic situation. No? Um, and then the next question is, well, uh, if we say that we can do something, uh, uh, what can we use? Uh, what kind of tools, approaches, methodologies can we use uh, to address complexity? And uh, at this moment is when we turn our side toward systems thinking and cybernetics. Well, in talking about uh, complexity uh, within the, uh, this, this uh, environment of, uh, of uh, systemic uh, problems, uh, just a couple of observations in relation to the first as below that says, uh, only variety can absorb variety. Uh, well, another way of expressing this uh, is uh, uh, telling that there are not simple solutions to complex problems. This is something that for us is obvious, uh, but well, it's uh, as below, and for many people it's not so obvious. Uh, and the second reflection, uh, also related to variety, is a good regulator, a governor of a system, has to be a model of that system. And the variety it provides has to be equal or uh, great, greater than the variety of the system that it pretends to regulate. This is the, 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 the conan ashby theorem. Uh, and this theorem has a, a, a very important um, implication for the managers, that is the following. The quality of managerial decisions cannot be better than the quality of the models they use. I don't use any model. Well, good luck, because the quality of your decisions are going to be equivalent to nothing. Eh? You don't have any model. Uh, well, sometimes you will succeed by luck, uh, but, but not because you are um, handling, controlling the situation. Uh, and this takes us to uh, the job of the managers or the leaders that is governing. Uh, what is governing? Governing uh, consists of being able to deal with complexity. So this is our uh, protagonist. Um, what kinds of complexity are we talking about? Uh, we have many classifications uh, about uh, types of complexity, etc. Uh, I, I am um, I'm only uh, will concentrate on uh, three three kinds of complexity. Uh, we have in the screen two main groups. One is the group, the complexity related the, to the uh, to the system themselves, the ontological complexity. Here here we have three three kinds mainly: ten, technical complexity, dynamical, and structural. And the other group is the cognitive complexity that has to see uh, with the people, with the persons, how they in, in share information and how they take decisions, uh, especially uh, group decisions. So these are the complexities that we are interested in. Here we have them again, and I will go through each of them uh, in relatively fast to clarify uh, what is the meaning uh, that uh, we give to um, each of those, those kinds of complexity. Well, here we have, a decision taker uh, that takes the decision A to produce B. Uh, in, I was trying to animate the screen, I, I'm afraid, uh, because this is animated, uh, which is just plain. Anyway, yeah, I will continue 
uh, because I wanted to put some emotion. Uh, the decision, uh, the, the person takes the decision A to produce B, uh, but after a time delay, the final effect is not B. The after a time delay, the final effect is going to be set. Uh, that uh, probably is not what the decision taker uh, was intending when he took the decision A. Well, this is a feedback group. Uh, by the way, is the protagonist uh, and probably the main component of the cybernetics and um, also the system dynamics is uh, all the methodologies um, um, based on the multiple feedback loops with delays interacting etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, well reality is not only one feedback loop reality is made up of many uh, many loops many feedback loops so when the decision taker takes the decision a to produce b uh, what he produces is not only B, but the activation of a cascade of uh, multiple feedback loops that start to um, put in motion and generating uh, different effects with different time delays. The outcome of, of all that, uh, all, all these multiple uh, feedback loops, uh, uh, at the end will, will be set. Uh, well, we can imagine that the decision taker that took the decision A to produce B, uh, he has no idea in most of the cases of what the final effect after uh, so uh, many impacts in multiple locations uh, will, will be producing set. Set is not going to be B, obviously, in most of the cases. This is complex, uh, dynamic complexity. Uh, by the way, I have to say that this dynamic complexity is very well handled by the system dynamics approach. Uh, it, it is, I would say, quite, uh, quite ideal. There are others, eh? but this, I think that this, because it's centered uh, just in, in that kind of complexity. Here we have an example also of the dynamic complexity uh, where the effects are distant from the causes in time. <laughs> uh, well, we have another um, observation to make in relation to these uh, feedback loops. And it's besides the uh, harmful effects uh, that we may uh, find uh, and activate with the decision uh, of this person uh, of taking the decision A, we have an additional problem. And it is that if cause and effect are distant in time, we cannot learn. And this is quite serious <laughs> because if we cannot associate the effect to the cause, we cannot learn. And if we cannot learn, uh, what's the value of experience? The experience serves to vary the mistakes. This is not very optimistic because we will be making mistakes all the life. This is a rather pessimistic view of the human being. But this is what happens. And by the way, this is what we are trying to avoid. This is why we, we will use these systemic approaches to avoid that this happen to us. Well, structural complexity, this has to see uh, with the, mm, the mm, structure of the situation. We have a, an organization, it's, now, it's, it's not animated, it's, it's, it, we, can, we cannot see the center of the image anyway. In the center, we have a, 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 a circle like this one. Uh, uh, Michael, do you see my mouse moving? Yes, okay. Uh, in the center, we have an organization uh, that uh, belongs to another organizations and that contains organizations, that contains organizations, etc. Uh, and each of those organizations have departments, sections, functions, uh, persons interrelated. So this interconnection of the different organizations and the sections, uh, the functions, etc., etc., uh, through all the um, levels is what we call structural complexity. That means it's the complexity of the structure of the issue that we are trying to handle, understand, etc. In the, um, the left, we have a, an image uh, that is just a, a, an abstraction of this idea. We have a sphere. In the center, we have a red sphere uh, that will be our system in focus, uh, the, the organization we are trying to analyze. And the, you see that this system in focus is in, in crossed by in several diameters of the, this sphere or, or, or cylinders, let's say. Each of those cylinders uh, can be considered 
uh, way of viewing my organization. Uh, we call them recursion criterion. Uh, we can see, uh, for example, if, if this is a person, this person can be uh, studying his situation in the dimension of the family. I will have a look to my fathers, my grandfathers, or if I go down to my children, my grandchildren, etc. This would be one dimension. But we can take another dimension, that is, for example, the work dimension. I work in a company, this company belongs to another company, that belongs to another, and inside my company I have divisions, etc., etc. So th that would be another different dimension, and so on. So when we study an uh, organization, it may be necessary in certain cases to take into account that we may have different views of the organization. This adds more complexity to the situation. If we go to the example of the person, we say, okay, but what do we take into account? The, the, the dimension of the war, the dimension of the family, the dimension of leisure, and the answer is you rather take into account all the dimensions because the person is one. Uh, so when you take decisions, uh, the working decisions, uh, working on weekends, etc., you have to have in mind that the other dimension is operative. Your family will be asking, oh, what are you doing? You are not uh, spending time with the family, etc., etc. So this is just an indication of the complexity, in this case, structural complexity. And the next uh, type of complexity has to see with um, uh, how the person decide and share uh, and exchange information and in particular, how they make group decisions. Well, here we have an image uh, of a person on the left that uh, wants to transmit a piece of information to the person on the right. Uh, in, we know the components of the communication channel, all of us are aware of, of them, is the, the we have the uh, emitter, the sender, we have the uh, transducer, we have the channel, we have the uh, decodifier, and finally, the message in the green line reaches the, the receiver. Um, and um, if we want to have the channel complete, the receiver should send back what he did understood um, about the information that he that reached him. So we have, again, in the same components, the codifier, the channel, the decodifier, and reaches back to the sender. Well, here we have the communication channel, ideally, um, the two um, lines have to be present, the, the goes line and the return line, if we want to have a complete uh, communication channel operative. But we have an additional problem uh, to add to those of having an adequate transducer channels, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and is that the, the person, uh, the receiver, we, we, we see the, the, the green line sending the information, and when that information reaches the receiver, it does not automatically reaches the conscience uh, of the receiver. It has to cross a, a, a series of cognitive filters uh, that uh, some of them are very, maybe uh, quite important because they may reject the information that reaches the receiver. And this is connected to how the receiver perceives the world, um, the, the, the cognitive biases, the ideological um, components, uh, the religious components, uh, the, uh, all the worldviews that the receiver has will condition uh, how he will interpret this information. Uh, but let's assume that he uh, finally got it and sends the, the, the answer back indicating what he did understood. And then we have all the channel back, the red one that reaches the sender. And here again, we have the, the filters once again, but now are the filters of the sender uh, trying to understand the, the message that came from the, the, the other person. And here uh, we also have to be lucky if the information reaches complete the sender. So when we see this, this image, the, the thing that comes to my mind is that when communication uh, succeeds, I call it a miracle. <laughs> because we, we have to be very lucky that we are able to communicate something, especially in socioeconomic issues, and that this information that I send is exactly understood as I wish it to be understood. When that happens, it's, it's really a happy, a happy moment, I could say. It's not very frequent. Eh? So the misunderstanding are uh, the, the, the common. No? Well, if, if those um, restrictions to the communication of human beings are not enough, we have 
another issue. Uh, when several persons want to decide in group, then we have not a conversation between two people because the conversation among the many people that are in the group. Uh, well, this image, by the way, is the image of the European Parliament with more than 700 members. Uh, so if they want to communicate uh, taking in the members in pairs, one and the other, assuming that we wanted everybody to share the information of everybody, of course. Uh, then what is the number of communication channels um, that we have? Uh, when we have n persons, the number of communication channels is n times n minus one divided by two. Uh, if we go to a group of 30 people, we would have 435 conversations. In the case of the European Parliament, we have 248,000 conversations. But uh, take care. This is in the first iteration. Once everybody shares the knowledge with everybody, they say, ah, now I reconsider what I was thinking, and I send a new piece of information. Then we have another 248,000. So uh, this is just to show that the problem is huge. <laughs> uh, and this is why it's so difficult to take decisions in groups when you have many people, uh, even the, the number is not too big. Like for example, in the case of 30, uh, 400 conversations. No? We say, well, yes, but we don't want to use the information that everybody has, no? but this is losing information. Well, this is just to give an idea uh, of the difficulty uh, and, and the, the, the complexity in this case uh, that is involved in the communication and group, uh, group decision uh, uh, taking. Anyway, if the message is not simple and this X the number uh, with a variety of content, then the figures are astronomical. So I, I, I don't lose the time getting into that just to say that it's almost impossible the communication. So let's go uh, to the next point is once that we see that we have this problem, this complexity, these three kinds of complexity, dynamic complexity, structural complexity, and the difficulty for exchanging information and taking decisions in groups. What can we do? Then we, we turn our side to the systems thinking uh, uh, field and say, okay, let's see what uh, the system thinking has to offer. Well, here we have dozens uh, of approaches. Say, well, uh, there is one approach, the system thinking. By the way, I use this occasion to, to tell that uh, I, I started working in the system dynamics field myself. And uh, uh, decades ago, uh, system thinking, particularly in the United States, was associated to system dynamics. System dynamics is one of the dozens of systemic approaches. <laughs> uh, fantastic, eh? uh, of course. Uh, but we have many approaches here. We have just a few of the ones that, uh, that did appear in the last 70 years. Well, we are not going to get into them, obviously. Uh, just to give a, a fast view of the main groups uh, that are normally uh, studied as uh, waves uh, of, of, of system thinking approach. Um, the first wave uh, that starts in the 50s, approximately, and lasts until the 70s, uh, considers that there is an objective reality. Everybody agrees uh, about what is the problem. And then uh, the issue is let's optimize uh, our decisions to maximize a certain goal function, et cetera, et cetera. Here we have the operational research, et cetera, the, the approaches of the, the uh, let's call it the first wave. The second wave that starts on the 70s, and uh, all of the waves last until today, of course, because they are adding uh, uh, knowledge to the previous wave. No? The second wave uh, makes a step um, forward, uh, telling, okay, uh, we see the issue, and I interpret the problem that we are trying to handle, but I interpret it with my brain. Uh, I, there is no, uh, there is no an objective reality. There is a subjective reality because the reality that I interpret and the other person will interpret it with his brain, with his mental models, etc., and the other with, with uh, etc. So um, the same way, uh, what tell us is, okay, let's take into account that the perception in particular in the socioeconomic issues uh, may be different. Different observers will interpret uh, differently the problem. Uh, well, there are here a lot of approaches, probably the most known, uh, that was one of the first um, um, that did appear was the soft systems methodology, but there are many others uh, also, including 
uh, organizational cybernetics and, and system dynamics, the, the, the evolution of system dynamics, etc. And the third wave, it goes a little further, even further. Say, okay, each person interprets the, the reality with his brain and each individual, each person has one interpretation, but we have an additional uh, the, the question to, uh, to make is, uh, okay, we interpret the reality with our brain and with the information that we receive. And the, 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 the research of this web, okay, have a look uh, about where this information is coming from. Who is upstream introducing in the pipe the information? Uh, who has the power to introduce the information? Because this information will condition the way you interpret the world. You interpret the, 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 the world with your brain and with the, with the information that you are receiving. So you have to add that component if you want to have the, the, the whole map uh, where you are taking your decisions. Well, just to, to end up with that uh, reflections about the schools, just telling that um, the, the one that we have to use depends on the kind of problem that we are facing. Uh, maybe enough uh, some of the operational research tools or, or, or the, the others depending on the situation. Or even we may need to use uh, several of them in the same study if if that is needed. And now we move on to organizational cybernetics. Um, that is the, the, the main <laughs> goal of, of the presentation. Let's talk about it. That is one of them. Uh, here I will give some elements and then I will stop in the framework that I propose to apply uh, the, the methodology in some short reference to uh, some pathologies. Well, the organization of cybernetics uh, comes from the cybernetics. Uh, all of us, I think, are aware of the, the, um, the, the birth uh, of that, uh, the contemporary bet, let's call it. Uh, the, that is a book of uh, Norbert Wiener in the 48, 1948, uh, entitled Cybernetics, or uh, Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. Well, the, the adaptation of the cybernetics to the study of the organizations is uh, what uh, no, um, Stafford Beer uh, named organizational cybernetics. That is the application of cybernetics to study organizations. Well, uh, this picture, or this, this image that we have in the screen uh, is, is, a, is, is very significant, uh, significant uh, in our particular case. This picture was taken in Valladolid, my university, uh, by the way, uh, it is from where I'm speaking, uh, Valladolid in Spain. Uh, well, this, this uh, speech was taken when he was awarded a doctorate honoris causa by the University of Valladolid. This happened in October 2001. Well, all the new doctors have to give a speech, uh, the, the honoris causa, have to give a speech to the whole community. Uh, and the, the speech that um, Stafford uh, wished to give is precisely what is cybernetics, is the title of the speech. By the way, the sheets of paper that he has on the hands are the content of the speech. Uh, the, the, the sad thing is that he was at that time already very sick and some months later he died. So this was the last speech that he gave because he died after. And then, well, it's, it's rather uh, curious that the, the title of the speech is what is cybernetics? It's like if he was saying farewell, farewell to the world, <laughs> telling uh, by the last time, what is that? No? Uh, he, by the fact, he made several jokes about the complexity of cybernetics, etc. To anyone interested in the speech, uh, there in the screen, you have the link uh, to YouTube. Uh, and you can see the video of the speech. It's, it may be... Uh, something worth. Uh, well, you have here the, the booklet where is the speech is edited uh, by the university in the 201. Uh, here's the, an introduction of, of his speech, just to give you... Uh, well, let's move on uh, to um, organizational cybernetics. The first thing I'd like to remind is that cybernetics is a word that comes from the Greek kybernetes. Uh, the Romans converted the word kybernetes in gubernator, kybernetes gubernator, in English governor or government, in Spanish is gobernador, so it's quite similar. <laughs> uh, so the, the meaning of the cybernetics is, is 
nothing to see with electronics, uh, uh, cyber fault, cyber pal, cyber, nothing to see with that, uh, not technology. It's just the science that deals with the control in the sense of governance, the uh, direction of the organization, because the meaning of uh, Kubernetes was uh, the, 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 the driver, the person that was hanging the ship to take it safe to the harbor. That was the Kubernetes, no matter if there were storms, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the Kubernetes is the, 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 the director, the governor. So all the management sciences should be called cybernetic sciences <laughs> because this is what they try to do, govern organizations. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see the content uh, of this uh, methodology. Um, a few uh, fast uh, components or, or concepts. First concept is viability. Uh, viability it refers to the capacity of an organism to maintain an independent existence, no matter what happens with the environment, ideally. Mm -hmm. Second, variety is the number of possible states and actual or potential behaviors that can occur in a given situation or problem. Number of states. As below, I mentioned before, only variety absorbs variety. Theory, uh, the current HB theorem, a good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. And the variety of the uh, regulating system must be at least equal to the variety of the regulated system. The uh, 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 obvious example is if we want to have five intensities of light in the room and uh, we have an interrupter with only two positions on off, it's impossible. The variety of the interrupter is two yeah, on off, and the variety that we wish to govern is five, low intensity, medium, higher, uh, maximum. Uh, uh, a manner that does uh, another person to control it with such an interrupter, uh, he uh, is uh, made no sense. Yeah? Well, this is obvious with uh, this example, but in the real world, it's relatively frequent that this happens, yeah? <laughs> that we try to govern something of a certain variety with tools that, that they don't have the required variety. So it's impossible. Well, and finally, we have the uh, viable system model that the, I'm going to explain, uh, I'm going to explain it now. So I, now in the following, I will give the content of what the viable system model contains uh, with some detail. Well, here we have in, in the green, um, kind of ameba, the environment. Uh, the blue circle would be the organization that we are trying to govern. And uh, the rectangle in, in yellow is the management of the organization. The management of the organization tries to uh, govern the, the organization. So it produces and sends to the environment the products, services, etc., that uh, it is supposed to produce. If we separate these components that I remember that they're embedded, the one in the other, we see that we have the environment, the organization, and the management, and we start to see the, the components of the variety handling. In fact, it's called variety engineering. That is how the organizational cybernetics handles the variety. How do we succeed in de deploying an amount of variety equivalent to the variety of the system that we pretend to regulate, um, there are a certain mechanisms. Um, a couple of them we have them in the screen. Uh, we have uh, in the lower part uh, the attenuation that goes from the environment to the organization, and we have attenuation that goes from the organization to the management, and we have amplification and amplification. Well, attenuation, uh, what pretends is to reduce the amount of variety first in the environment. So the amount of variety that the organization will have to face is smaller. So we increase the possibility of matching it. And on the other side, we have the amplification. That is the, the small variety that I am able to deploy. If I could amplify it, uh, then uh, with the two mechanisms, reducing and amplifying, maybe that I can match the variety of the situation. And the same happens with the uh, organization and the management. Uh, a good example, for, for example, of attenuation would be the ex exception reports, amplification, delegation, etc. I amplify my capacity, delegating, 
in other uh, people. Well, these are just examples of uh, variety engineering. There is another important mechanism, very important mechanism for variety handling, uh, that is um, the mechanism that, uh, that um, tries to ab absorb by design the variety inside the elements. You have the environment. If we could um, get um, as much as possible variety absorbed directly in the environment without the intervention of the organization, then the amount of variety that the organization should have to handle would be less. It is called the residual variety. And the same with the organization. If I can get that some of the problems uh, that uh, in the organization we have in the production or whatever can, uh, uh, can be absorbed directly inside the organization, then the amount of uh, problems of residual variety that the management has to handle would be less. So increase the possibility of, of the management of, of governing adequately the organization. So this, this uh, mechanisms are very powerful uh, and very um, uh, relatively easy. For example, in the case of the environment, the dealers of cars in, in a company that sells cars, uh, if uh, the dealers absorb huge amounts of variety, uh, so only the residual variety goes to the car manufacturer, that is the purchasing of the car, mm? but not the, the, the conversation with all the potential buyers, etc. Well, in this image, we have the application of this uh, um, idea of residual variety handling in the case of the coronavirus. It was applied with, with um, more or less success uh, in the environment with the mask and social distance, etc. These were examples. So the residual variety, let's say people infected, <laughs> the idea was to have less people infected uh, that go to the hospitals, to the uh, primary care, and less people infected, very severe, uh, seriously infected to the um, units of uh, intensive care uh, because the, the less people, the less um, collapse. <laughs> the, 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 that did not happen, by the way. We had a collapse in, in many uh, in, in hospitals all around the world. No? But this is a good example of how to handle a variety, in this case, uh, in a healthy uh, health um, issue. Uh, the Bayer system model, uh, let's go now to it. The Bayer system model is created just to handle of that, uh, uh, to um, handle of this complexity that I was mentioning uh, by the, the, the creation of an organization that will be able to uh, handle this, all, the, all those complex issues. Um, the the Bayer system model uh, was taken uh, by Stafford Beer uh, from the human nervous system, was the inspiration for him. So he took the nervous system, by the way, here we have in the image on the left, we have uh, a very simplified uh, uh, image of the main components of the uh, human central nervous system, the, the, the spinal cord, uh, the cerebellum, et cetera, et cetera. In the center, we have the characteristic functions of these uh, anatomic um, uh, um, components of the, of the nervous system of humans. And on the right, we have the abstraction of those functions. This abstraction of those functions is, is what uh, Beer took uh, to, in, in, to create his viable system model. They contain these functions that replicate uh, the human being. The main propositions, three of, the one, of them, uh, of the viable system model. First, an organization is viable if and only if it has a set of functions that uh, I will explain now, that the theory um, indicates. Second, any deficiency in any of those functions or connections between them negatively affects the viability of the organization. And third, all those uh, organizations that, uh, that uh, um, uh, we're going to, to, to see um, have to work according to those requirements recursively. So uh, when we made a division of a company in smaller companies, and et cetera, we are not talking about uh, uh, increasing the photographical resolution. No, uh, every organization that, is, uh, um, that contains sub-organizations, that contains sub-sub-organizations, each of those organizations are complete entities. The son is not a portion of the father, it's a complete uh, human being, complete. And, this, the, and the grandchildren uh, is, is not a portion of the, no, it's a complete human. The same thing applies to the organizations. Uh, the way the viable system sees them is that they are complete and they have to uh, have all the components uh, 
of viability of a complete organism. We will see it in a subject. Well, what are the main components of DBSM? And, and, and is there are five systems. Uh, they are quite easy to remember because they are named one, two, three, four, five. So many people laugh because thinks that this is a joke of Stafford Beer when he put the names of the systems. Well, he was tired that day. He didn't want to think too much. And there is a, a very sound reason. He said, okay, if I call a system, system four, and do you want to know what is system four? I am not going to put a word attenuating dramatically the variety of the explanation. No, you want to know what system four is? It's go to the books, go to the chapter with uh, system four is explained. This is why he named it one, two, three, four, five. Well, uh, let's go back to our uh, organization, environment, organization, management. Let's rearrange them. Uh, we, we continue having these three. We move them a little bit and we will make zoom in the operations, in the circle. Let's see what is inside. We see that now a, a, a new set of environment operations management appear. I will add another. I will add another. These are operational units. For example, factories of different models in a manufacturing company. For example, in the case of Renault Spain, the factory for the Laguna, the factory for the Megan, the factory for the capture, etc. So each operational unit, this component that did appear uh, are a complete organization that will have uh, the same three components, environment, in this case market, uh, factories and management, environment, factory, management, etc. This is, um, well, we have here another example, um, in this case applied to the um, political organization of Spain, of the country, and many other countries. We have the, the whole country, and we have autonomous communities, for example, three of the 17 that Spain has, Catalonia, Castilla León, Andalusia, etc. Just to show another example in a different environment, uh, different from a company. Well, all that is a, 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 what is called the system one. So the system one is the system that produces what the organization has to produce. That's the system one. And it's made up of organizational units. Maybe companies, maybe hospitals, maybe um, uh, communities, maybe <clears throat> whatever. <clears throat> system two. The system two uh, is the system that appears necessary to dampen the oscillations that normally appear when each of the operational units fight for the resources to meet their goals, and they may start they may start in, in, in being in conflict with the others because they fight for uh, finance, financial resources, human resources, technological resources, markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to harmonize the interaction between the units, uh, we need a, a coordinating mechanism <clears throat> that is system two. For, for example, in Spain, we are now in the in, in the problem of setting up the government, and they are trying to to fit the different regions so they harmonize their interactions and be happy belonging to the, the to the unity to the whole well this is system two uh, the next system system three <clears throat> this system is uh, the one that is in charge <clears throat> of, of all the operations and uh, normally is associated to the operative management in, in, <clears throat> in, in management uh, he is responsible for the here and now of the organization he tries to <clears throat> control the internal environment in real time <clears throat> also to generate synergies, to optimize the working of the operational units, etc. So this is the function of system three. Has the authority uh, to manage the, the operational units, including to delete some of them, eh? or we give more resources to one uh, rather to the other, etc. This is responsibility of system three. The next uh, component is system three star. This is a part of system three in the sense that there are uh, there is information that normally does not travel through the, the accountability channel that goes from the managers of the factories, for example, to the industrial director of the whole company uh, in the country, uh, there, are, there is information that does not go up in a report, in particular, the corrupt behavior. <laughs> Nobody reports what he did wrong this week. 
I have stolen 6,000 euros this week. It was not so good as previous that I couldn't get 10,000. It's not um, frequent <laughs> that this kind of reports go up. Well, I just put this example very, very grotesque, you know, just to indicate that the, there is information that we have to get uh, some other way. And this other way is with a system three star that I, as we see in the image, it captures the information directly from the operations, directly from the factories in this example, or directly from the, 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 the uh, community or whatever. And this information is in the one that complements the information that system three needs to um, govern uh, the system one. In the right corner, up, uh, up in the right corner of the screen, we have examples of uh, system three, the mobile radars in the highways, uh, the tax inspections, the internal corruption controls in political parties, etc. These are good examples. Uh, a way of expressing the power of system three star is if we take a, a, a sheet of paper and we, and we put iron um, uh, components, a small iron component, and we put um, uh, uh, the imam, uh, I don't know how to call it in English, <laughs> uh, uh, Mikhail, help me. I, how do you call a man uh, that that attracts um, a magneto? Magnet. A magneto. Magnet. A mag a magnet. Uh, if we put a magnet uh, below the sheet, all the uh, small components of iron get beautifully organized according to the magnetic fields. <laughs> System three star um, tries to get this beautiful organization of the components according to what is desired as a desired behavior. So this is the system. It's very important. System four, this system, uh, we see that now started to get into the rectangle of the, of the square that is the management. Uh, system four is watching outside, is watching the environment, what is happening outside, and uh, also what will be happening in the future. And all this information has to come to the inside of the organization and be transmitted to the system three to be implemented in the system one. This is normally uh, called strategic management in the, in, in the management theory. Uh, the responsibility of system four is to watch outside the future and uh, to continuously, not making strategic plans every five years, no, no, continuously getting information and transmitting this information to system three and start to um, implement it together with system three in system one. This uh, red circle that we see here and this uh, feedback loop in green is the interaction between system four that gets new information about the needs for change and pass this information to system three. So he will implement it in system one and system three tells the system four watch out i cannot convert my factory from in um, cars uh, fossil fuel um, uh, petrol etc to electric cars in three months uh, please give me two years or whatever so this interaction is uh, is conflictive because system four is uh, wishing always to change and system three is uh, wishing always to not change. <laughs> so, because if I don't change, I increase the efficiency, et cetera. So they are normally in conflict. This is the adaptation organ of any organization. Uh, so when an organization does not have that, uh, we know what is gonna happen. When the environment changes enough, the organization will disappear. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, finally, well, this is an example of the operations from design by Stafford Beer in the 70s. This is a real picture. Uh, it sounds as science fiction. It was on the 1973, before the 201 of this space odyssey. It was similar. Uh, he, he, he got it. Well, this is just a, a image representation of where system four and three would take decisions together with five. No? Anyway, we continue to system five to end up the model. Well, system five uh, is uh, associated to normative management. He is the responsible uh, for clarifying the vision, the mission, the goals, the values, who are we, what is our purpose, why, why are we here for, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's system five who uh, clarifies that. And also he has another important role. And is, we see these two brackets that, um, that uh, handle this, uh, organ, uh, this adaptation organ, 
the variety that the system four and system three could not absorb because they did not get an agreement, this variety, these issues that they, where they cannot um, get an agreement on, on, on them is solved with, uh, or absorbed by system five that say, okay, guys, stop here. This is what we are going to do because he is the one that has clear the vision, the mission, the purpose, the identity, etc. And the model ends. So we have now the complete end. And ideally, all the variety that was in the environment related to my organization has been absorbed by all these many components that we have uh, seen in a very simplified way, of course. Well, the next uh, issue, here we have the, 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 the complete map. We go to the, the next aspect that is very important in the viable system model, that is the recursive character. Every viable system contains viable system that belong to viable systems. And each of them has to meet with these five systems that I just described, these requirements, system one, two, three, four, five, communications among, between them, et cetera. So let's see how that works. We have the environment, we have the organization, the huge variety in the environment. We start to divide the environment in sub-environments. We start to divide the organization in sub-organizations. We continue dividing, dividing the whole world, Europe, Spain, Castilla León, Valladolid, or in, in, in the car industry in the world, in the Renault industry in the world, in Renault Europe, Renault Spain, the factory of the mega, etc. Ways of dividing the environment. So each sub-environment has contains less variety than the previous, etc. And the sub-organizations we have to handle less variety than the previous, etc. So this is the way we divide vertically uh, and create, by the way, the vertical structure of my organization. Uh, we go back to the uh, representation that we have seen. We see the operational unit number one. If we travel to the next recursion level, there we have the next recursion level. We see that I will go back. You see, next recursion level, we see that they have, we have the same image turning 90 degrees. So we, here we have a viable system model, but turning, turning 90 degrees. Here we have the operational units, system one, system two, system three, system four, system five, system, system five, and the same for the other operational units. So we see that the model is always the same. And this is another uh, of the huge um, value uh, components of the viable system model. Once we understand one, like the one that I just have shown to you, you understand all. It doesn't matter if you are studying a small organization or a huge organization or the whole planet. It doesn't matter. It's always the same model. So this is a tremendous power. This is why uh, some researchers, and I agree with them, like Jack, Mike Jackson and others, say that uh, we can consider the, the biosystem model as the theory of organization. <laughs> Uh, normally, when we uh, teach in the university about organizational theories, uh, we use the term jungle of theories to indicate that there are many hundreds of theories. This is only one, mm? and that's it. Uh, and most of the ones that are uh, uh, taught, taught in the universities, uh, business school, etc., are particular cases of this model. You can make them fit in certain parts of the model. In general, I'm talking, simplifying a little bit. No? Well, let's go to the next point. Well, here we see how we create the vertical uh, structure of my organization. I start with level zero, uh, the, the car industry in the world, the car industry in Australia, the car industry in Sydney, uh, the factory number uh, uh, three of the uh, model, uh, the brand, uh, etc. So we see that always it's the same model and we are changing the organization. And each organization is a living entity that has to have all the viability needed components to keep alive. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not a division of an organization uh, that we made the, 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 the organizational tree, making a, the, the composition. No, no, it's complete entities. Mm -hmm. So these are a big difference with uh, other theories. Let's see now uh, the next component of the system model, uh, just to end up with it, and is the communication challenge. Uh, we have seen the functions that we handle the variety with different focus and different aspects. 
And now we go back to our uh, image again. And we see all these lines that connect functions. For example, this one. This is not a drawing to show that this is connected to this. No, this is a communication channel. These are communication channels. These are communication channels. In this case of the next recursion level. These are communication channels between recursion levels. We see that we have a communication channel between system five of the system in focus connected with the system five of the next recursion level, etc. Communication be, be, between the uh, recursion levels, in this case, system four, etc. So this image uh, with the colors now that uh, we put colors on all the lines, uh, all the, those lines are the nervous <laughs> the connections. Uh, and the whole thing is the Nesbo system of my organization uh, or the information system, you want to call it. And this, this perception of the information system of an organization is very important and very powerful for, uh, for example, for the information science engineers that they, ha they have to uh, buy a new information system or to create one. It's quite important that they know this information system for which of the functions is going to be used because the kind of information we use in system one is different from the kind of information we use in the system two that normally is uh, production plans etc the information of system three the information of system four can we imagine capturing information the intelligent um, capturing systems uh, all the system etc so the the information that is needed is different so an uh, uh, information science engineer that has that in his brain, his mind, uh, makes him more powerful for doing his job of information science engineer. Mm -hmm. Well, we, go, we move on uh, just to the framework. We have seen the main components, even a little faster, <laughs> of the viable system model. Let's see how, will we, uh, how can we apply it to the real world, and to, to real problems. Well, I, I propose using these four uh, steps. Uh, the first step uh, dedicated to uh, clarify the identity. Who am I and what is my purpose, my company, my organization? Second, create the vertical structure. Third, check that uh, each component uh, environment organization has, uh, since it is a complete organization, has all the five components, one, two, three, four, five connections, et cetera, et cetera. And fourth, uh, to check the degree of coupling of all the organizations at different recursion levels. So this would, this would be the, well, the proposed way uh, to doing that. Well, here we have a, a, a general image. We see the environment with the sub-environments, the organization with the sub-organizations. Uh, and we would go, uh, well, this would be the vertical dimension creating the vertical structure. And on the horizontal dimension, we have the checking that uh, we take this pair uh, in red and we amplify it here on the right and see that it has the five components, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Et cetera. And we have to do that with all the pairs, the um, environment organization, environment organization, environment organization, et cetera. So we have to do all this task with all the um, organization. In the first step, uh, identity recognition, we have to clarify who, what is the organization and what is not. This is very interesting because this helps us to clarify the boundaries. What is outside and what is inside? What is environment and what is organization? And from the point of view of the environment, to clarify what is the relevant environment, the current, the present environment and the future environment. And also to, to identify the sensors, the communication channels to collect information in real time continuously and to show this information inside the organization in the operation room in this uh, adaptation organs to collect this information and see how it will impact and the needs for changing etc et the second step creating the vertical structure let's see with an image how we do that here we have the image here we have the vertical structure the organization the sub organization etc uh, for that i propose using what I call re the recursion levels critical factors matrix. This is a matrix, let's see, uh, a matrix where we have in the rows, the recursion levels, the level zero, the level one, uh, the world, uh, the, the car industry, the car industry of, of Australia, the car industry in Sydney, etc. And in the columns, 
we have the, the main relevant issues that I want to take into account at each level. I put here in the example 10, can be 25, 8, any number. No? Uh, just this time, maybe a good representation, a spatial scope, the, the purpose, how it's instantiated at each recursion level, the organizations, the st uh, stakeholders, the uh, organizations that are um, uh, influential, uh, legislation, actions, means, communication, etc. So we can use this thing or any other uh, uh, number that will, you wish. Third step, uh, analyze. Here we have the pairs, the organization, uh, the environment, the organization, and the management, and the viable system model that I have to apply to each of those um, components. And here we have to um, um, check for the following first, that each element, system one, system two, the first, exists, it's present. Second, it has the capacity all the, the, the tools needed to carry out its function because it may exist, but maybe not well developed. And third, that it exists, has the capacity, and it is used. <laughs> because, for example, in many uh, situations, we have, for example, talking about System 3 Star, they have a big books uh, clarifying what the behavior should be, etc. but they don't use it. <laughs> so it makes no sense. So I have to check for the three components. And the fourth step is checking the degree of coupling of all the organizations at all recursion levels. The system fives, the purpose for the car industry in the world has to be consistent with the purpose of the car industry in Australia, with the purpose of the car industry in Sydney, with the purpose of the uh, factory, uh, the, the manufacturing uh, company uh, for the model Renault, whatever. So all these system fives, the purposes have to be consistent. In particular, we are talking about sustainability, just to give an example. All the sustainability related decisions at the level of the world, at the level of the uh, a continent, at the level of, of a country, a, a community, a city, a quarter, uh, a building, a family, an individual, all have to be consistent. And this is something that can be checked with the matrix. When we go, for example, at the, about the purposes, here we have an example, a real example that we um, applied to the <clears throat> a study that we did um, in the University of Coruña. This is one of univers a public university in the northwest of Spain. Uh, I work with the vice president of the university, applying all these ideas that I just exposed to you uh, for the university. It was a project that lasted eight years. So we use the matrix, uh, we, we see five recursion levels, the whole Galicia region in the northwest of Spain, and the urban region of, of two cities, the, the, each of the cities, the campus, the buildings, uh, and the purposes. We see that the purposes may be different, uh, obviously, because it's not this, the purpose for the whole region of Galicia, than the purposes for a specific building that has is connected with the architectural technology, et cetera, et cetera. No? The purpose may be, the, the instantiation may be different, but they, they must be coherent uh, at each level. For example, the, the example that I was giving about sustainability will affect how the uh, legislation is done at this level, how they is designed the urban plans uh, in the cities, how the, the campus is um, designed from the point of view of energy usage, et cetera, et cetera, and the buildings, installations, and, and so on. So, and here we have some examples of the other columns in relation to organizations that did affect the university in this case, legislation that was uh, applicable uh, at each of the recursion levels, and actions that were identified mm, that are different for each recursion level. In fact, here we identify some 30 different actions um, for this university. So this is the way that it was applied in reality. Uh, I recommend very much this map because we don't have all the complexity of the viable system model, system one, two, three. This just is a chart, but it's very powerful because in just a chart, we have the main vertical structure and the main components that this may speed up the conversation between the decision takers of different levels. If uh, the president of the university is talking about some um, decision of this level, has not been interrupted and missed with a decision about designing a building, eh? uh, for example. So this is very powerful because it, it is, is very good to say, okay, 
let's see at which recursion level are we uh, now um, deciding level two okay we situate in the level no no we have designed the building then we go, go to level four etc so it's very at all very powerful for communicating and finally and i just will end up uh, michael <laughs> to not surpass too much the time uh, just a, 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 a short reference to the pathologies i'm not going to get into them just uh, up to now i did uh, show the healthy organization but the organization they also have sicknesses like the human beings no? they call it pathologies this was taken by the way from the from the medicine and we have, i have structured the pathologies in three main groups um identified 26 we may find hundreds of them but i just took the 26 that i consider quite frequent no? uh, the first group it refers to the structural how we divide vertically the organization and the environment second the functional pathologies that uh, are referred to each of the functions system one two three four five to see what may be wrong in each of them and the third is the pathology related to the information system to the nervous system which are quite different each of them so i'm not going to um, explain them just to show you the index <laughs> here we have the the, the structural here they ha you have the image of the the structural pathologies the functional pathologies you have pathology in the system five in the four in the three in the three star in the two in the one so we have many opportunities to to be sick <laughs> uh, and here we have the image where we have the different systems and the pathologies that may affect each of the systems and finally the pathologies related to the information systems also they affect different parts of the organization so to end up uh, just a, a final uh, reflection uh, in connection with the uh, geological epoch that uh, has been starting to uh, be used the term uh, something like a decade ago uh, to indicate that we the human being left the holocene and uh, entered into the anthropocene in the sense that the human being uh, has become a geological force if we take the example of the amazons just to uh, take an example uh, if we let's assume that we cut all the trees is it make no sense of course no? but let's assume then the problem is not uh, we run out of trees in the amazon no the problem is that the climb in the south america they will run out of water um, to a huge extent because most of the water is produced by the trees uh, by evaporation they go to the clouds and these clouds move and go to the south of america and then we have rain there if we don't have the trees, we will we, we not have the clouds, we will not have the, the cloud rivers, we will not have the rain. So it's, it's just an example. Uh, so this new uh, era or uh, um, geological epoch uh, uh, is the human being by the first time in the history uh, that is acting there. So uh, what can we do for this hugely complex <laughs> problem of handling what is going on in the planet? We want to continue here, not have to go to Mars. No? Uh, and it's okay. How do we govern in this new geological epoch? And once again, we say, okay, let's have a look to organizational cybernetics. <laughs> what organizational cybernetics has to tell us uh, and to help us? This doesn't mean that is the only approach, of course, no? it's not so uh, fundamentalist. No? There are many others. But I think that this one is very powerful because it, it, it's just this simple model, that relatively simple model that I just have described, you can apply to the whole planet or to different communities or to different organizations, etc., uh, etc., et and always the same also. Once the leaders know the model, they can talk in the terms of the model, and that speeds up uh, tremendously the conversation. And um, finally, uh, uh, we talk about System 5. System 5 is like a lighthouse anchored in the organization this this is our identity and these are our purposes and i throw the light to all the company to follow these um, directions let's assume that the lighthouse moves out of the land <laughs> the drifting lighthouse was a signal but they did not see it <laughs> when, when we don't have a system five <laughs> enough powerful uh, we have the lighthouse moving around. I don't know if the wall is in that situation. And uh, if it is in that situation, let's hope that we can anchor the lighthouse. And my last uh, slide is this, that is the lighthouse of my city. I was born 
one kilometer away from this lighthouse. This was built in the first century by the Romans. And is the uh, oldest lighthouse that is operative throwing light. Uh, so it's the light that we can take as a metaphor for the systems thinking community like yours, uh, Mikhail, uh, uh, throwing light uh, to the society. So the uh, managers, the Kubernetes may drive their ships, their organizations safe to the land. And that's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much for your uh, passionate work. In uh, last Thank one, you very much. all this, you have it in, in all this description and all the details, you have it in the in the publication for anybody that wants to get deeper on, on the issue. And that's all. So thanks very much, Michael. Thanks. And I, I apologize for the time user. Fantastic, Yosef. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll just open it very, <laughs> I agree, Anthony. Thank you. Um, um, anyone, guys, open to, uh, to questions. I'll just leave it to just uh, shout out. Still absorbing a lot. This is very interesting. Thank you. So, question, Jose, um, communicating with people who are very short on time and uh, have a bias towards um, simple communication on simple answers for what are inherently vastly complex problems. Um, Ideas on bridging the gap. Uh, you, you say, how can we solve this um, variety issue, uh, complex problem? Um, and they ask me for a fast answer and simple. <laughs> As we have seen, this is not very, uh, very easy to do. I would uh, tell that it's impossible to, to, <laughs> to, to do it. <laughs> uh, but what we can do is to get some approximation to that. Uh, if, the first thing would be to say, uh, have a look. Uh, you asked me five intensities, and you asked me uh, to give you an answer that has only two positions. So let's clarify that, OK? Then uh, let's see how we can increase the number of positions of the interrupter uh, and reduce a little bit the number of uh, intensities that you uh, are asking. So let's see if we can uh, in, in match it. This would be the first observation if I have the time to tell it. <laughs> because the person that listens, listens and interprets the world with his brain. And I, tell, I told at the beginning that this was one of the biggest problems. How can I transmit uh, this uh, these concepts uh, to the other person. Well, I would say that if I succeed in transmitting this information in one hour, that's not too much time. If the listener has the patience to listen to Mikhail, to explain in the decade one hour, to explain uh, these concepts, or to Anthony eh, that you are asking me, <laughs> Uh, one hour uh, after listening that, uh, uh, if if that is understood, uh, as I hope uh, um, uh, it happened with my presentation, uh, then you say, okay, uh, now we uh, make the make me the question again. Once you have uh, listened uh, my one hour speech, make me again the question. What is the question that you are asking me? It's a complex issue, and you are asking me for a simple answer probably uh, the, the, the conversation would change. So it's a question of, uh, let's say, education. Um, um, we are trying to find, Anthony, because this problem that you mentioned is very frequent. Uh, the people don't, don't have the patience. They say, okay, forget me. Don't give me a speech. Yeah? Uh, just give me solutions, not speeches, et cetera. No? Uh, this is very frequent. So we are trying to find ways uh, to transmit the essence of what I did explain in, let's say, five or 10 minutes. We are looking for it. Eh? <laughs> we don't have yet. But really, we are trying to find a way of expressing using image, sound, uh, some uh, communication tools, really, uh, to convey this information packed in a, such, such a way that may be understood enough uh, to change 
the perception uh, of the person that is asking such a um, simple answer of a composition. So uh, this is a big problem. Eh? Uh, so this, uh, uh, my answer to that would be, uh, besides getting this this uh, grial of the communication eh, in such a small package, uh, but I think that you are in a good track because if uh, your group uh, are made up uh, of 400 people, like uh, Mikhail indicated me that you have something like 400 members, if those 400 members are aware of th these concepts, they may act as amplifiers, variety amplifiers, to their area of influence, and that would, would grow exponentially. So the number of people that would ask you this um, not reasonable uh, question will, would be less, 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 in the same way that you expand the knowledge. So the answer to that is education and spreading the, the, this knowledge that is contained in this in these ideas. Fantastic, thank you, Jose. I think that was good. Sorry, Elida, you had your hand. Uh, sure. If if no one else have a question, um, I I wanted to add to what Jose said. First of all, again, thank you. Um, that was very informative. I've always been trying to understand VSM a little bit better, but um, but this was very helpful. Ah. Uh, Anthony, one of the ways I've, um, we didn't get to talk about pathologies a lot, but hopefully you will get a chance to read the book. Um, the One of the ways I've helped managers understand VSM is not to explain them what VSM is, but to very quickly use VSM to identify the areas uh, that is missing in their systems. A very ba basic example from my current uh, engagement is, uh, we have a big portfolio with 15 teams. They are all doing project delivery. They have these sessions, which they call product owner synchronization, which is effectively product managers thinking about the directions of the future, um, say future, uh, the, the future work. What? But in reality, they are using that as a scrum of a scrum or as an operational meeting where they're just focusing on here and now. They're dealing with, oh, I have this resource issues or this new thing is added. So what I recognize that, for example, is two things is missing in that group. They don't have a front door function where it can actually scan the coming work. And also when the work comes to, to the group, they can't, they don't have a mechanism to process it. So this was, that is always, this team is always in a sort of, a, a, like a sinus, uh, sort of a diagram, it always goes up and down and up and down, and they don't understand why there is so much um, oscillation in the work. And it's as simple as our function that is scanned the environment is very weak, and it is not connected to, or there are not enough communication channel to where uh, looks at the current work and look at the resourcing and all of that. So I picked it up very quickly like in the first week having a VSM lens. But when I explained it to the leader, he said, oh, um, yes, that's a problem. How did you figure that out so fast? And I kind of showed a simplified version of VSM, right? So my um, response to that is, I, I don't try to explain to them what VSM is. I try to use it to help. And then when there is enough curiosity, if they are interested, then, because the sort of answer I can provide and the speed that I can provide those answers is very different to what they have observed and experienced before. It took them, I don't know if they get McKinsey, it takes them six months and another $20 million to give them a pack that even ultimately don't give them the real problem, right? So that's one. Apologies. Can I ask a question? Um, if, yeah, so... Jose, I um, by the, sorry, go on. By the way, one observation because you mentioned that in your uh, teams, uh, um, I had experience when I uh, talked to managers of real um, organizations, not in the university with students, no, no, a, a manager that have been working for years, people that has 40, 50 years, etc. And when, when I explained the model and then I uh, showed them the pathologies, 
uh, is very funny because they start to laugh because they recognize themselves <laughs> or a, a colleague. Oh, this is that guy, this is that organization, this is that department. So they start to see themselves through the lenses uh, in a very tremendous way. So it becomes funny in a, in a lecture. I don't know if it, inside the company is so funny, <laughs> but uh, uh, yes. I have read here a comment of David Whitty. Now I, 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 you asked me the question, Ali, and say that um, he would have um, he would uh, have liked to hear about system uh, systems thinking theories. Uh, uh, well, uh, the organization of cybernetics is one of them. Uh, there are dozens, hundreds. Well, we saw the three schools. Each of them contains systemic theories uh, that uh, cover certain parts of the complexity. So we have many system theories. Um, I made reference to two of them. One is system dynamics, that by the way, in the United States was, was associated with systems thinking, and it's only a part. Yeah? And organizational semantics is a systems theory because it handles totalities, complete systems. The protagonist of, of cybernetics is the system, the organization that uh, we are focusing. So it's a absolute system theory. Uh, of course, I did not comment the others. First, it's not the purpose of the speech. And second, because there are lots of them. Anyway, please, Ali, go ahead with your question. Um, the question is, uh, when I first saw VSM and when I show it to others, it, it immediately um, create this perception of hierarchical organizations, which I know VSM is quite the opposite of that because one of the things that has suffered, we always talk about is maximizing the autonomy of system one. Um, how do you, how do you deal with that when people look at the sort of a um, visualization of VSM and say, oh, but it's just too much hierarchical. I've, I've had that, that reaction a lot. Yeah, this is, this is, a very common um, a doubt uh, because uh, the, the way organizations are normally seen uh, are hierarchical. Uh, well, there have been some um, evolution about going to uh, less uh, hierarchical, less vertical, let's say, a more horizontal organizations. This is a kind of, okay, an approximation, but nothing to see uh, with the viable system uh, uh, model and, and, and way of seeing organizations. It's another way of seeing the organizations. Uh, if we take, a, for example, if we take an orange and we cut it by half uh, by the poles and we open it and we see the image with the different uh, radius, uh, uh, well, the different the, the two, two halves, but if we cut it by the Ecuador, let's say, by the center, what we would see is a a point with radius. And if we show one person one image and the other other, they would think that they're talking about different things. One thing is considering the organization from the point of view hierarchical, is a way of seeing it. We think that is less powerful, much, much, much less powerful than this other way of seeing it that is not hierarchical, is organical. We see the organization, the, the father is not the boss. Uh, of the of of uh, the children is not a component of the father. It's a different entity, it, it, especially when it has 40 ye 14 years, <laughs> 13, 14, 15 years. We see that it's quite different from the father. So it's not a, a, a comp it's a, a, another organism, etc. Et so this way of seeing is different, and the problem for applying it that is a difficulty. Uh, when managers say, okay, how uh, do I apply these ideas in my hierarchical organization? That is difficult. I, I, we have to recognize it. Uh, um, was asking, I think that was uh, uh, one of the one of the, 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 the members of the audience. And so what? <laughs> so what? So what? What is difficult? Is the answer. So applying it, uh, when you try to get an organization that is existing hierarchical, and you come with a viable system model where uh, uh, what you show are functions, they say, well, where that uh, section fits in that model, uh, it may not fit eh? because that function may be spread 
in different uh, um, components of your organization. So um, it may happen that in a real organization, a person uh, has two, three, or four different roles, system one, system two, system three, system four, may happen that the, let's say different hats. Now I'm working as system two. I am working on the production plan to coordinate the line number one, line number two. Now take care, I'm system four because I'm now checking for the new technology uh, for the batteries, for the cars, lithium, etc. Now, uh, 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 now I'm system star. Okay, I'm going to look, uh, asking for help to make an uh, opinion survey in the company to see if the people is happy. No, I change them. So in the real, uh, in, a, in a, a company, uh, you have to um, see how this theoretical model that contains the needed functions um, doesn't tell you how do you create your um, organigram now uh, you can create it as you like uh, hierarchical as you like but having in mind that inside that hierarchical organigram those functions have to be present and this is what you have to check i don't care if you have this very vertical or horizontal or whatever uh, you just have to check that, okay, let's see, um, uh, at the recursion level, whatever it is, a uh, factory level, for example, let's check system one, two, three, four, five communication channels, the algodonic channels, et cetera, et cetera, in all the components that I didn't uh, have time to get to there. So it's a kind of uh, um, dif difficulty eh? uh, because we are trying to force one image into the other. Mm -hmm. the, the image of the, op the, the orange, uh, they, they are different. Uh, but it's the same orange. Yeah? Yeah. So we have to uh, interpret it. So a way of solving that is making an abstraction and seeing the viable system model as a kind of informational domain of the, uh, the, the human being, in this case, the, the organization. Uh, and this information domain uh, will feed the persons taking decisions in different parts of the organization but this information domain will tell you what kind of information you will have to handle uh, connected to the different functions that have to be present. So uh, that way, if you see it as a kind of information metastructure, uh, you are not tied so strictly to the departments, sections, functions, etc. Uh, it requires some um, intellectual exercise. This is true. Uh, but this is uh, just to, to, to end up and uh, complete the, the answer a little, uh, when we apply the DSM, C12345, but as I explained in the framework, we, can, we have a lot of um, components that do not need such an um, effort and, are, and, and are, still are very powerful and provide a lot of information. That is, when you create the vertical structure, with all the recursion levels, that is nothing to see with the system, two, three, nothing to see with that. It's a, a, a very elemental, huh? the vertical structure, the recursion levels, the instantiation of the purpose, etc., etc. Even if you stop there, you have gained a lot uh, for uh, improving your management, and in particular, the conversations among the managers in your organization. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. Thanks for the question, Aludad. Anyone else, guys? We're a bit past, as Aludad typed in, but um, Jose, I think you have a bit more time to answer a couple of more questions. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, oh. at your... Hmm. We are after work. We can, well, at least I can stay for a It's up to you. I know. I, I, yeah. I, I, in Spain, have a, a, one thing in mind. It's 9.30 in the morning. Yes. So I, I have the whole day. Yes, Jean, Jean <laughs> you have to go to bed. Me. You have to go Jean to bed. But it's probably I, I in the morning in the States. Thank you, Pandley. Okay, any more questions, guys? I'm still processing I, it. Yeah, I um, Jose, I don't know. I'm I'm sure you're familiar with um, Davis Norden. Are you familiar with Davis Norden's work? Uh, he came up with uh, Kinevan framework and uh, talking in the and doing research in complexity and decision making space. Dave, are you happy with the answers I gave? <laughs> because Dave, uh, uh, Whitney, 
Ah, you don't have the micro connected, Dave. Sorry, yeah, I, I wasn't actually asking about um, other systems thinking theories. I'm quite quite familiar with quite a few. It was more around um, wanting or bemoaning the fact uh, that um, leaders and sea level don't really study them or don't seem to know very much about them. Yeah, there's a response to Anthony's question, really, about finding time to speak with them when they should be the ones knowing this stuff. Uh, we thought if they're in charge of these these sorts of companies, so, yeah. But thank you, Jose. Uh, sorry, yeah, thank you, you. Hey, for you the observation. Me? I appreciate it. Can you guys hear me? Sorry, now? can you yes, hear me? There. Yes. Uh, sorry, I was asking though. about uh, Jose. I was asking about David Snowden. Uh, he works in the complexity science, and one of his comment was if uh, was um, if a Stafford Reed was alive today and he was aware of the recent development in complexity science, he wouldn't have come up with VSM, which I find unhelpful. Um, have you heard of that comment before? You know, when um, yeah, yeah, the yeah. new complexity science, you know, yeah, VSM yeah, is yeah, so, yes, so yes, 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 of course. Uh, in fact, uh, there is some, in, in, in internet, there is a, a, um, a kind of uh, um, podcast or something similar, that talks about the limitations, uh, dramatic, let's say, limitations of the BSM, uh, um, making reference to three years in the 70s, from 70 to 73, uh, uh, and studying only that those three years. Say, during these three years, didn't work very well, etc. It's true. Uh, when the blood uh, transfusions uh, were uh, started to be used, in the Middle Ages, uh, most of the people died. In fact, Bogdanov, uh, that was, by the way, one of the creators of the system theory, not, not uh, Bertalanffy, was Alexander Bogdanov in the uh, 1910s, 1915, uh, in this case, in, in, the, in Russia. He was the creator with the technology, etc. He was a, a doctor himself, and he started to make a transfusion of blood to himself, and he died <laughs> because he was not aware of the, um, the blood types, etc., uh, and the incompatibility. This does not mean that the blood transfusions are wrong or are bad. No, means that they had not enough knowledge at that time of the whole issue. Uh, when the uh, VSM was used in the 70s in Chile, etc., by Staffordbeer, they had the technology that they had at that time. But uh, in these 50 years, the world moved didn't stop in the 70s. Uh, so we have internet, we have instant communication, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many of the things that could not be done at that time, today, yes, they can be done. And for example, one of the um, uh, discoveries, let's say, or, or findings of Safarbeer was not from the 70s, it was from the 1995, approximately. That, that is the things integrity protocols. These things integrity protocols are aimed, have nothing to see with the VSM. They have to see with the communication. The, uh, the third type of complexity that I did mention have to see with the, how, the difficulty to take decisions in groups. How do we share information? The number of communication channels that I showed that was huge. But the, 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 another of the good findings of uh, Stafford Bayer was the integrity protocols allow a group of people, let's say 30 people, in relatively short periods of time, three days, it's, it's, it's time, but it's just three days, they can obtain in three iterations more than 90%, let's simplify, eh, if we can quantify that, eh, of the, all the knowledge that the 30 people has about the issue at hand has been shared among all of the members. This is quite different from the a chart that I, I did show before of the number of communication channels if we do it the conventional way. Well, this protocol that is contained in the Teams Integrity protocols allow to increase dramatically the amount of information that can be shared between a group of people in a relatively short period of time. This is an example of something that uh, we are discovered after the 70s and was not used at that time because uh, first, uh, he didn't have developed that, 
Second, uh, you did not have the technology, etc. For example, I used that approach uh, in some experiments that I did in the university with the students uh, using these protocols uh, to see the difference of behavior of a group of students that used using internet to exchange the information. So it's a step further. They don't need to meet. Like in the things integrity protocols, they normally meet in a room. They have to be in the same place for three days. This is very expensive, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, you can do that through internet and you can enlarge the time. You can do it not in three days. You can use a mouse or whatever the time. And I did the experiment with two groups. One group doing the um, a kind of running a company, a simulation game, running a company, and the other group running the same company, uh, but with the knowledge obtained with just one session of Teams Integrity one day. And through six months, the decisions that were taken uh, by the group that uh, was exposed to the Teams Integrity protocols, and they shared the knowledge among all the members of the group, was consistently better uh, through all the six months that lasted the experiment uh, than the other group. So this is just an example. We need many more, no? but this was an example of how powerful uh, those new ideas uh, that were not possible uh, when Stafford developed the viable system model. So this observation of Shannon is, I agree with it. Eh? Uh, he would not do the same thing. Of course not. <laughs> he, uh, but the main components that are there, uh, many of them are valid. This doesn't mean uh, the fact that they, are, they don't cover all the problematic political influence, the psychological components, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All those elements that, that are not handled. By the way, the biosystem model does not tell you how to design your production systems at all. You need other technologies for doing that. It does not aim that, kind of that. In fact, it is, I have no time to uh, comment it, but now uh, I, I will use the question to make observation. The, um, the viable system in the cybernetic is fantastic to uh, study the structure of an organization from the information point of view to see if it has all the components and the information required to carry out all those functions. But it's not good for telling, okay, and now, so what? What do I do? To move from here to there. This it does not tell you. It can tell you what is the there. Uh, uh, I should be uh, in the food in that state. Yes, it can tell you that, but does not tell you. And then I have to take the decision and this and this to uh, increase that to uh, uh, hire so many people here and there. No, this doesn't tell you. And how I evaluate the decisions under uh, different scenarios to see which of the decision is better to reach a certain uh, goal, et cetera. It doesn't tell you that. And for that, you need to use other approaches like system dynamics, just an example that I mentioned. System dynamics it tells you, okay, you want to change your organization from now to a new ideal stage that has these many uh, these uh, components and these goals. Okay, let's explore the decisions that we have available under the different scenarios uh, to see which of the decisions under the different scenarios increases the chance that we reach our goals. And this is another methodology. It's not the system dynamics. It's not the cybernetics or the way of system model. This is why uh, we propose combining it uh, with others. If we go backwards, we propose combining with soft system methodology that is an interpretative uh, approach, uh, uh, upstream. And the upstream, we, we propose to combine it with system dynamics to make it dynamic. In fact, if you are interested, if anybody of the audience is interested, uh, Marcus Vanninger and myself wrote a paper in the system dynamics review in the 208 that is entitled uh, Organizational Cybernetics and System Dynamics Unnecessary Synergy. <laughs> so anybody interested can see there why we say that, that one has things uh, that the other doesn't have and vice versa. So when we combine them, we cover more space. Not all, of course, but much more. I don't know if I answered <laughs> Ali that. Thank you so much. No, that, that was awesome. perfect. Thank you. That's fantastic. Okay, any more question, guys? No question, I have to go.
family calling it's dinner time. I would love to stay. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, Jose, we will um, we will invite you. I mean, I hope you can you can present in future as well. We probably would like to zoom in into the pathologies a bit more for future That's sessions. Right. Uh, now that we have created this baseline, I will make sure we ask everyone to watch it. And uh, maybe that 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 would be the kind of a more practical side of using pathologies and um, excellent. Yeah, yes. Deep dive into that. We also didn't good... touch on the uh, on the tool as well, uh, Jose. So that there was some I've seen some demos of it. Um, I was very interested to see how that can help as well. Usually. Once you understand everything, this can kind of automate some of the work, so to speak. So make it easier to execute the whole thing rather than do everything manually, so to speak. So maybe we'll touch base. Thanks, Ali. That we'll touch base uh, for that on another session. Okay. If no more questions, last call for questions. Yeah, Jose, I would really, really, really like to thank you from the heart from and all of us. It was a fantastic talk, and uh, yeah, we will put it on the on the uh, on YouTube, so you'll be able to um, think of what else you want to tell us in the future. As Ali that said, there are a lot of things we would like to dive into. So looking forward to that. Thank you so well, much again Michael, from all of us. Thanks very much, Mikhail, uh, again uh, for the invitation. For me, it's a pleasure uh, to uh, explain uh, uh, those ideas, and also it is a huge pleasure to hear the, the, the questions, uh, putting uh, in question the approach. I love them because they increase the variety. <laughs> so yes. I want to have more variety eh? and to see the flows uh, uh, that may exist in the approach to improve it. So I welcome very much the critics. In particular, I welcome very much the critics. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for all of us. Thank you. Take care and thanks. Good night, guys. Thanks to all for attending. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sasha. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Or well, good morning. <laughs> good morning, yes. <laughs>